A few years ago, there was an ice storm here in Rochester that knocked out power at our home. And I mean, nothing was working, refrigerator wasn't working, our heat wasn't working, so we all kind of huddled up in the living room together with our blankets. And after what felt like days, but was really just a couple hours, the power finally came back on. Everything, everything turned on in the house without issue, everything that is except for our security system. And you might not think that's really all that big of a deal, depending on where you live, but Pastor Hannah and I happen to live two blocks north of where most of the crime happens in the city. Uh, to date, this year alone, we've had three carjackings happen outside of our home. We've had one police chase that has ended in our, by hitting our neighbor's tree. And we've had multiple instances where I'm outside working on my car and a homeless man approaches me and gets uncomfortably close and tells me that I need a boating license. That's a story for a different day. Uh, but the point is, when you have four kids that are under seven years old, a little bit of security brings some peace of mind. We, we could not get the security system to work no matter what we tried. We unplugged it, we plugged it back in, we called customer service, nobody could figure it out. Finally, they identified what the problem was. When that ice storm had come through, there was some sort of connection on the telephone wires specifically for our internet. And it, it weighed it down and it cracked the case or the wire or whatever it was attached to. And so our security system was, was basically inoperable because it wasn't connected to the right source. It wasn't connected to the internet. So it ended up being a real simple situation. Call up a different internet company, get them in, get them connected. Now we have security. Now we have peace of mind. I share that all to say, this, to, to illustrate this really. We are more connected today than we have ever been before. We have our smart homes with our, 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 um, our security systems. We, we have computers in our pockets where we can access news from all over the world with a click of a button. We can call family and friends anywhere in the world. We can buy products overseas and have it shipped to our house in just a matter of days. We are more connected than ever before. But here's what I've found. As convenient as many of those connections are, all it takes is a storm to come through and render those completely obsolete. All it takes is a dead battery in your phone for it to render it completely useless. All it takes is a, an illness or an accident or a small decision that can lead to losing somebody that you love. And as, as convenient and connected as our world is, it's also these connections, are, they're precarious and they're fragile. Which is why for me... I want to be connected to something that is lasting. When, when I think about connection in the world, I don't want to be connected to, to temporary things that just come and go, that can break down, that aren't reliable. I want to be connected to something that can anchor me through the storms of life. And today I want to look at the truth that Jesus is our anchor through the storms of life. That he is a connection that will never fail, that will never abandon us. And if we stay connected to Jesus, we will experience his power, his purpose, and his peace, no matter what we might face. We're in a sermon series right now called Banding Together, where we're, we're kind of wrapping this series up. We've been meeting in small groups outside of Sunday and we've been reading scripture on our own and journaling about it and praying through it. And then we come together as a group and we talk about how God has been speaking to us. And then we've kind of double-clicked on this. We've, we've not only talked about it in small group settings, but we've talked about it here in a Sunday setting. And the past 14 days or so, we found ourselves in the book of the Gospel of John. Pastor Hannah did a great job preaching on John chapter 13 last week. And so I'm going to pick it up just a couple chapters later on in the Gospel of John. But, of course, like we always do, I want to give you a little bit of context for what's happening in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is one of four historical eyewitness accounts of the life of Jesus. And this one is interesting because where Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they, they emphasize a chronological order to the way Jesus operates in his, in his life, the book of John doesn't pay as much attention to the chronology of how things happen so much as the theology behind why it happened. 
That's not to say that the other Gospels don't focus on the theology. It's just there's less of an emphasis on the chronology in the book of John. And, and as you read through it, it's an amazing book. I mean, we read about just the, the belief that Jesus is the Messiah. We, we read about the seven miracles or signs of Jesus, the I am statements of Jesus. We learn about his preexistence, his incarnation, all these big theological terms. And it leads us all to this point in John chapter 15. We've, we've identified through the book of John that Jesus is the Messiah. And in John chapter 15, Jesus is speaking with his disciples in his final days. He knows he's going to be crucified. He knows he's going to be killed. And so these are, are words of imparting wisdom to the disciples. These are some of the, the last things that Jesus is going to say to them. And he knows that soon they will lose their physical connection with Jesus because Jesus is going to die. He's going to be crucified and he's going to be raised to life and seated at the right hand of God. They're going to lose that physical connection. And Jesus knows this all too well about the disciples and about many of us today is that we face temptations and we'll face temptations to connect ourselves or anchor ourselves to the temporary things of this world instead of the creator of the world. The disciples, they're, they're going to be tempted to run, to hide, and even deny him. And so Jesus says this to them in light of the coming days. I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. He prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. Some translations say, abide in me, and I will abide in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me... You can do nothing. Now, I just want to pause there before we continue reading. Jesus is saying very plainly that he is the vine and we are the branches. And apart from Jesus, we are powerless. We are powerless to live a godly life on our own. It's like Ephesians 4.14 says that, that we're like infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Without Christ, we are powerless. I couldn't help but think of the summer in, in the garden that we've been working on at our home and we had a, a bunch of blackberry bushes that were growing, going out of control. They were growing through the fence. They were encroaching into the yard, even despite our best efforts to kind of sequester them off. So I had to do what every gardener does. I had to prune the branches. And so I went through and I began cutting off the branches. And as I did, I made a big pile of branches. And that night, some wind came and blew some of the branches away. The rest of them just kind of stayed piled up, and, and they eventually withered away and rotted and died. And this is, this is the imagery that Jesus is trying to elicit here when he talks about him being the vine and us being the branches. See, we, we have to understand that connection to God, what, what we call remaining in him or abiding in him, if we want to live a godly life, it's not optional. If, if you want to live a life and you want to have life to the full, you must be connected to the source of life. Otherwise, you'll be like those branches just blown to and fro and withering and rotting and dying. And how many of us, we know this, we know this in our head, we, we, can, we can put that together and, and understand that, but when it comes to putting this into action, it's increasingly challenging. How, how many of us, we, we seek connection to the things of this world rather than connection to God. We, we know we should pray, but, but sometimes we're just tired from the day and popping music in our ears or listening to a podcast seems easier. Or, or we know we should read scripture, but, but we're just too tired and we, we fall asleep before we even get the chance to read it. Or, or sometimes we know we should just spend time with God, whatever that looks like, and we're tempted to veg out and watch the latest show on Netflix. We we know that we need to, to step into our relationship with Jesus. We need to remain in him. We need to abide in him. 
But so many times we're tempted to seek connection elsewhere. In fact, I, I just uh, I read a, a couple studies this week which were really eye-opening. They were performed by Barna Research Group and Pew Research. And they found that 68% of people who call themselves Christians pray daily. So that's pretty good, 68%. But 32% either prayed monthly or, in some cases, seldom or never. They also noted that only 45% of Christians read their Bible at least once a week, while the other majority of Christians seldom or never read Scripture. Lastly, in in one of the studies in 2022, Barna found that while most churchgoers believe that they are called to evangelize, only 10% actively engage in regular spiritual conversations with non-Christians. If the statistics are accurate for our church today, it means that one-third of the people in this room are still struggling to cultivate a daily life of prayer. It means that over half are struggling to open up scripture on a weekly basis. And it means that the vast majority of us don't know how to have conversations about Jesus with people who don't know Jesus. And I read those stats and you wonder why the, the world is so disenfranchised with Christianity. Maybe it's because, as I've quoted before, there are a number of Christians who profess Jesus as Lord of their lives with their lips but then walk out of the door and deny him with their lifestyle. See, we have a priority problem when it comes to connecting with our creator. We have to prioritize connecting to Jesus rather than the temporary things of this life. And and it's so challenging at times, isn't it? And you might wonder, why, why is that? Why do we have such a hard time prioritizing this connection with Jesus. And, and please hear me when I say this. I'm not coming from a holier thou than thou position as if I've figured everything out. I struggle here too. I think I, I see this play out in my life when I, I often prioritize what feels good in the moment versus what is good for me in the long run. I, I prioritize what seems convenient in the moment rather than what's good for me in the long run. I mean, I, I do it with my diet all the time. I should eat a Caesar salad, but Cadbury chocolate eggs are just so good. I know I should eat fruit, but Cadbury chocolate eggs are so good. I'm just trying to subtly hint that if you get us anything for Christmas, Cadbury chocolate eggs are the thing to get us. No. See, here's, here's what I'm trying to communicate. The quick fix that we seek today can cost us the lasting change that we need tomorrow. The quick fix we seek today can cost us the lasting change we need tomorrow. To remain in Christ is to daily seek him, to to grow our dependence on him daily, to walk with him daily. And I think what you'll find amazing about about what begins to happen in your heart and in your life is, is when you truly prioritize that connection with Jesus When you truly seek to make time with him day after day, Jesus starts to do something incredible in your heart and in your life. John actually talks about it in verses 6 through 8. He says, anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples, and this brings great glory to my Father. When we seek Christ, we begin to bear fruit. I heard a pastor say it like this this week. They said, a plum tree doesn't grow plums because a plum tree eats plums. He said, a peach tree doesn't grow peaches because a peach tree eats peaches. No, the the fruit is grown for the benefit of someone else. When you bear fruit, it's a lot like my grandparents' old house in New Mexico, full of, full of orange trees and apple trees and cherry trees, and they provided shade and nourishment and beauty to every person who walked into that household. The fruit isn't just for you. The fruit is a byproduct of your connection with Christ. The fruit is, one, for the glorification of God, and two, it blesses others. The fruit is for the glorification of God, and it blesses others. And and the fruit is really a telltale sign of if you're abiding in Christ. 
See, if you are abiding in Christ, you will bear fruit of the Spirit. But if you don't abide in Christ, you'll still bear fruit. It just won't be the kind that brings nourishment to other people. See, are, are we bearing fruit in our lives? Are we bearing the fruit of, of selfishness or self-indulgence or self-fulfillment? Or are we bearing the fruit that comes from abiding in Christ, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and goodness, and self-control? When we truly abide in relationship with Christ, we begin to bear fruit that glorifies God and blesses others. And out of that comes this, this joy and this love that cannot be explained. Look at, look at what the Apostle Paul, or the Apostle John, rather, says in verses 9 through 11. He says, I have loved you even as a father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. See, what can be tempting when we hear a sermon like this is to go out ready to make those connections and make that time with Jesus and go, if you're like me, I'm an all or nothing type of person. So I'm going to go out, I'm going to read the whole book of Genesis by the end of the week. I'm going to wake up at 3 a.m. every morning and pray until my kids wake up at 6 a.m. I'm going to show up in a soup kitchen and serve every single night. And I'm not telling you that you shouldn't do those things. Those are great things to do. But, but what I want to encourage you is to look through the proper lens when you do so. You see, joy isn't found in doing more. It's found in being with Jesus. Joy isn't found in doing more. It's found in being with Jesus. Real joy comes from being connected with Christ, from, from developing that obedience and that trust and that dependency, cultivating a, a life that is dependent on the God of the universe. Joy, joy is this byproduct of staying close to the vine. As, as some of you know, Pastor Hannah and I are in the process of moving. And so we're going through all these boxes in our house, and we're sorting through all these, these um, mementos that have made it from house to house for the past 10 years and finally getting rid of it. And I came across a, a box of a bunch of stuff from when I was a teenager and uh, a couple boxes from when I was 9 or 10 years old. And I started pulling it out, and it was all my notes from church and my devotional books. And see, my... My mom always made it a habit to have a devotional book. So she'd read scripture and then she'd have like this book that she read daily and she'd, she'd answer questions and, and write stuff on it. And it served as a great example to me. And so I began uh, going through, you know, at 9 and 10 and 11 years old, reading scripture and reading devotions and writing about it. It's so fun to look through and see what I had written to myself. You know, I, at the time I was convinced I was going to be an artist and so I, I wrote that I was going to use my gifts to glorify God. I was going to use my art to glorify God. And the art was atrocious. But I had this desire to glorify God with it. And then I had this Bible verse that I had memorized. And I wrote, Jesus Christ gave up his life for us. And I would I'd write that in the notes. And, and I, I'm saying that all to, to say this. If you're familiar with my story at all, you know that as I got into my teenage years, that daily habit of meeting with Jesus slowly began to fade. It slowly began to diminish. And I just want to take a minute and talk to the youth in the room today, if that's okay. You are not too young to start pursuing a relationship with Jesus. You are not too young to start prioritizing reading scripture and praying daily and being in the word and allowing that to cultivate fruit in your life. And if you will do that, even at a young age, if you will stay connected to the source of life, it will begin to do something in you and through you. It will begin to shape you and mold you. People will look at you and be like, man, there's something different about that person. There's, there's like this joy that they have or this peace that it, it doesn't make any sense. If you're a teenager here today or younger, Stay connected. Use this opportunity to grow in your faith. Use this opportunity to develop that relationship with Jesus. And, and let me say this to the adults in the room. We want this for our youth. We want to see our youth grow. But as a mentor has told me time and time again, we can only lead people where we've gone ourselves. For the adults in the room, if we want to see a church filled with youth, 
that love Jesus, that live their lives in such a way that reflect the glory of Jesus, that make wise decisions, we must stay connected. If we want to see our kids grow up with a vibrant prayer life, they need to see us praying daily. If, if we want to see our kids grow with a, a deep love for Scripture, they must see us opening the Word of God on a daily basis. If, they want to, if we want to see our kids be evangelists and go out and tell people about Jesus, we cannot hide our faith when we go to the drugstore or we go get our haircuts. We must lead. We must go first. You cannot lead people where you haven't gone yourself. We must stay connected to the source of life. And I realize as the worship team comes forward here to lead us and close us in song, I realize that as I preach this today, you might hear this and realize that there's areas of your life that feel disconnected. Maybe for you it's been weeks since you've opened up scripture and, and read scripture. Maybe it's been weeks since you actually sat down and really prayed. Or, or maybe you've had opportunities to share the word of God and it just, it's passed you by. If you feel disconnected today, Jesus invites you back. Jesus invites you to reconnect even in this moment, to connect with the source of life. And Jesus can begin to do a mighty work in you and through you. He can grow that fruit of the Spirit in you in such a way that people will be amazed. Jesus can do immeasurably more in our lives than we can ask or imagine if we will simply stay connected. And being connected to Christ, it leads to power, purpose, and peace, no matter what we may be facing. Let's bow our heads in prayer. God, we are so grateful for who you are, for all that you're doing in us and through us. And Lord, we admit that some of us, we, we came here today and we have, we have lost connection with you. We haven't stayed connected to the, the source of life. We it's been a while since maybe we've read scripture or we've prayed or even talked openly and honestly about our faith. And Lord, we, we pray that you would forgive us for that and that you would call us back to you. Lord, you are the source of life. I pray that you would change us, that you would shape us, that you would make us in your image. I pray that our youth and our kids would grow up knowing you and living and loving like you and that, that we would see out of this church future pastors, future missionaries, future business leaders, future business owners go out, uh, future fathers and mothers and that would go out and, and live and love like you and have impact on their community. Lord, we give you today and we ask, Lord, that for those of us who may feel disconnected, that, that you, would, you would create space in our hearts or we would create space in our hearts to hear what it is you have to say to us. We pray all this in your name.